All right, everyone. After lunch, everybody's full, ready to go. Um, can I just, I just wanted to uh, say a couple of things before um, we get started. Um, Fran will um, introduce the, our keynote. Um, on the table, there are some cards for um, our survey, um, if you want to become a sponsor, and also if you want to uh, join one of our working groups. If I could encourage everyone to please take the survey. Um, it's short, I promise. Um, your, your feedback is really, really important. Second announcement, Sean Murphy, our social person, has volunteered, and Mike Mendez, has said if, if anybody um, that wants to go out to dinner after, um, after this, later in the evening, to just after this, this um, we end today, just meet Sean and Mike in the back of the room and they will find, if they know Boston, they'll find a place and, and uh, can all like uh, go social life, ha have a drink or, or dinner. All right. All right. I'm going to turn it to Fran. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thank you. When Diane told me uh, about this topic um, and she said, Fran, this is like precision medicine is like last year. This is... The, the, the latest and greatest, I'm like, I gotta look this up. Make sure that we start on uh, equal footing. So um, by definition, um, a digital twin is a virtual model designed to accurately reflect a physical object or process. The digital twin looks like and behaves identically to its real world counterpart. So scientists can predict possible performance outcomes and issues that the real world product might undergo. So with that in mind, and, that as, and as that is the uh, backdrop, I am very pleased to present our keynote uh, topic on the digital twin and our two speakers. Um, so before I get started with handing it over to Saeed, um, I'd like to um, give you a little background about uh, Saeed because um, it's pretty impressive. So Dr. Saeed Tabit is a Dell Distinguished Engineer. He's the Global Lead for Mobile Mobility Digital Ecosystem and Digital Twins at Dell Technology CTO Office. He's a member of the Object Management Group Board of Directors and a member of the Digital Twin Consortium Steering Committee. He's also a founding member of the Program Committee for IoT Solutions World Congress and contributes to several AI, edge, digital mobility, and digital twin industrial initiatives. He serves as a fellow at the Cloud Security Alliance. Not done yet. With three decades in the industry, Dr. Dr. Tabat contributes to technology innovation forums, guard start, got, guides startups through mentorship and coaching and consults with regulators in the US, the UK, EU, Japan, and Singapore on technology adoption and its impact on business and society. Saeed, Saeed continues to work on, on challenges around AI ML the future of mobility and autonomous vehicles, edge computing, digital twins and ecosystems. He holds patents in various business and technology areas, including artificial intelligence, automotive, security and privacy, regulatory compliance and risk management, IoT, cloud and edge computing, simulation, hardware infrastructure, communications, distributed computing, and others. 
He is the co-founder of Rule ML, as well as an author and editor of several book series and peer-reviewed scientific papers and book chapters. And I want you to know that I actually edited this down. <laughs> So with that, I am pleased to turn the uh, podium over to Dr. Saeed Tabit, and he would be followed by uh, Sean Murphy, who will explain how all of this fits in the I2B2 world. Thank you. Thank you, Fran. Appreciate that. It's always humbling when we are in front of a lot of researchers and scientists and, and business colleagues here when we hear about what we do. But life can be fun and, and busy, but it's really interesting to uh, maybe now I'm going to take us back to a little bit of history and then bring us back into the future. So since this is uh, just after lunch, maybe um, um, I'll, I'm going to leave a little, a little bit of the talking to Sean as well. So some of the topics he and I agreed I'm not going to talk about, so it's just good. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to join you. Uh, this effort, I was here this morning briefly and, and listened to a few of the presentations. Um, it's really interesting to see where we're going with the effort that you have within your initiative and uh, the kind of things we can expect in terms of outcomes uh, and also future innovations across the board. So, so let's talk about the, the, the partnership between humans and machine, something we call this at Dell, but basically uh, when we talk about digital twins, we, uh, we really uh, want to look as, as uh, Diane, kind of you, you made a good point there as well, but it's really kind of thinking about how do we work with machines in the future compared to kind of a lot of the things we, we, we've experienced for many of us across the, the, the changes in technology. So let me take you a little bit into the, um, um, what we've seen before. So basically, this is kind of the road or the, the path towards a digitally connected world. But you know, if I can take some of you back to maybe even 1990 or the 50s or the 60s, where many computers were purely working and connected. They're really, you know, you're doing what some would call informatics inside the computer and then starting to connect to them and building these capabilities across the board with communications. But when we think about information society, kind of 95, maybe 93, uh, was a good start there with the beginning of the internet, the early beginnings that some of you are aware of. And then from there, moving on to the, 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 the further development around in 2000, and you probably remember hearing about e-commerce, and which was so new at the time, can we really do that, right? But then uh, when I connect to I2B2, I mean, you, uh, someone this morning said, you know, we collect data, right? And we want to make sense out of it. And we think about, you know, we bring the industrial internet, meaning getting the machines themselves also to, to kind of tell us what they're sensing and what they're acting on, et cetera. So the, uh, what's called Industry 4.0, right? This revolution of IoT and edge and, and kind of the next level of mobility. Uh, so since 2013, 2014, 2015, many, many companies in Germany like Siemens and others uh, in the US with GE started to push this kind of new level of collaboration between the machine and the human. Um, and then moving forward, so when I was looking at this, uh, I was at a meeting uh, where the UN was kind of trying to draft their path in terms of what a digitally connected world means. Kind of the same work you're doing in you know, hospitals around the world and this initiative uh, from uh, a lot of different countries, uh, bringing data from all over. There was a talk about the interoperability and the challenge. I think this is also a big challenge there. So, so I wanted to kind of take us back and put that in perspective, and, and you'll see when I end my talk why I meant that. And um, I'll just, uh, I usually don't like animation, so, so, so let me give you a few numbers. Um, can you tell me what a zettabyte is? Of course, Dave, you can't say that, or Jeff. Huh? But can you, do you know what an idea of a zettabyte is? Uh, it's a lot of data, right? You know what a terabyte is, right? What if I told you it's a billion of those? If you were to buy a laptop with a terabyte, it's a billion of those. Or a gigabyte, it's a trillion of those. So, so when we think of the amount of data, 
although not all of the data is relevant, as you know, some of it is maybe short-lived, and then you gotta get it over, you gotta be smart about it. But it, this tells you, I mean, this, this IDC uh, number uh, is interesting. I think it's probably even bigger than that. 73.1 zettabyte, it's a lot of trillions of terabytes, right, uh, of, of, of gigabytes. Um, so, and, and this is generated by connected devices, right? I'm not, I'm not talking about what we generate in sending emails and, and, and uh, uh, doing some work or writing code, et cetera, but, uh, or querying your databases and others, but this is really IoT devices or connected devices around the world, whether it's in commercial or in, uh, in the world of industrial machines, in, uh, think about tractors in agriculture, or wearables in a mining or an oil and gas environment. All of those are generating tons of data, but the problem is, you know, when we go with that, where, where is this data stored and how are we going to deal with it moving forward? Obviously, it's not going to be in a handful of data centers. It's not going to be in a handful of, uh, um, of clouds. Um, it will start to distribute itself. Just like in this room, we have a lot of connections. You all have smartphones, and some of you have watches, et cetera. But, so that brings in another level of, of compute and the way we would look at these architectures in a different way. And if I think of it kind of relating it to I2B2, just think about your patients, right? And when we capture the data, the sources of data. And, and so this is going to be very important. And that's why 75% of this data, like I said, maybe more. And 2025 is really just next door, right? Um, and in the next three years, I think it will be more. And what happens in the future by 2020, 2030, for example? Um, and then the next thing, as if this is not enough, we got to do this fast, right? Consumers or even companies, they want their results immediately. They want them yesterday. They want to know the outcomes. In fact, um, you don't want to predict what the machine, what, what would happen. You don't want the machine to do that prediction. You want them to try to imagine what you actually need before you think about it, kind of thinking about that future. So when we go there and you think about 5G and 1.8 billion, uh, and this is another question, you know, a lot of you have bandwidth at home. You know what the average speed here in the US, roughly? Close to 100, yeah. Megabytes. So we're talking about 20 gigabytes. In fact, in 2017, when I was looking at 5G, we were just talking about 10 gigabytes, and we were all excited. If you have a one gig connection. So when you think about 20 gigabytes, think about the average being 90 to 100 megabytes, right, from an average uh, in the US. And if I put it in perspective, I was telling Jeff, uh, my colleague over there earlier, can you watch 3,500 4K movies at the same time? That's what, it, that's what this can do. Now, try to extrapolate that and put it in perspective, again, with all the capabilities and work we're doing here. And then the other um, uh, values that I put in there, uh, the 100x lower power consumption, we're talking about sustainability. These things are expensive. They use a lot of power. They cost a lot, and, and there's not enough resources for it. So we've got to be smart about how are we going to bring this power consumption down as well. So here is another challenge for all of us. And, and this is uh, uh, from the ION Global Forum, where they're saying by 2030, we can do this by 100 times less power. So I hope we can get there. And, and then the, the latency is an important thing. Often you're watching something, and all of a sudden you're losing uh, that connection. Or, um, or, or thinking about the, the capability, the bandwidth as well. So these numbers are here just to kind of give you an idea to put in perspective. If we're going to do digital twins, and Frank gave a good definition for it, we're going to think about the precision, the fidelity of the models. Some of you are into AI. How are those models going to give me something I can trust as far as outcomes or the results or, or the data? So this is going to be very important for the success of this technology. And to that, not that I want to repeat the definition, but I want to just put it in perspective. This is the definition from the Digital Twin Consortium. And I wanted just to point to three keywords, right? Synchronization, because typically you've got to synchronize the real and the virtual, right? And then you have a frequency of synchronization. Not everything gets synchronized in real time or in the same level of real time, but then you have to have a level of fidelity. So the knowledge that you have as a as a person or as a physical machine uh, has to be at least as close as possible to the same level of, of model uh, fidelity from that perspective as well in the, in the twin. 
So, so we'll keep that in mind and we'll come back to it as well. And speaking of history, and I like always to go back and I always to point to things. So this is a slide I, I, um, I use often. So if you wanna read, if you love to read Mirror Worlds, pointed to that in, in, the, in the early days, even before Dr. Greaves, uh, he's a member of our consortium, uh, started to talk about uh, the, the definition from a PLM point of view. So he was very focused in manufacturing and he still is at the moment. And in collaboration with John Vickers, who is also very active within the consortium uh, from NASA, who actually was one of the first ones to implement a digital twin uh, for their very complex system, as you can imagine. Uh, so this is really interesting from that to put in perspective, the sort of definition, but here you get to see a little bit of that representation of data and then the information in the process. So you're often doing both of those as you work through the system. Now, I mean, again, uh, the digital twin concept is not really new. First time I was, uh, I was exploring this, so Dr. Greaves started talking about it in um, uh, almost uh, 2002. Uh, but this, uh, I, I was working with GE at the time back in 2013. They already started to build some of that capability within their systems. But I really just wanted to share that how important uh, uh, this across all kinds of industry, whether it's in healthcare we're working, or in manufacturing, or even education, other worlds, uh, sector uh, and domains, um, the same range of enablers is there. You know, AI was one of them, and still is. Uh, modeling and simulation, uh, it's kind of interesting when you see a lot of companies that have been very active, I won't name their names, but uh, creating simulation systems that were amazing for the last 30, 40, 50 years for some of them. Now they're all rebranding into digital twin companies because they're kind of going to that level. Their technology is important. And also the fact that we're making more progress with the industrial IoT, more and more connections. You saw the numbers I showed you earlier. On average, every minute you'll have a few thousand connections around the world that are brand new uh, created. So that's important. And also we're seeing, you hear more and more these days about the AR, VR, or the XR, and, and 5G, and of course, edge computing. I talked about the distribution, no more centralized systems, we're moving into that level. Uh, I usually, in keynote, I wouldn't put these TAMs or these expected markets, but I really wanted to share with you how big this thing is, and I think it's over 100 billion now with the revised uh, numbers from Gartner, but it's really just to put it in perspective. And I'll, I'll go a little bit technical to come back to the term I used earlier there about these critical requirements. If you're going to develop a digital twin, you have to think, again, about precision, about the concept of real time, what it means to you, to your use case, and also, obviously, the, the high fidelity of these systems. Some of you who are into AI or into simulation, this is very important to look at. Um, what we've seen at Dell, for example, you need intensive compute for these large systems, uh, a lot of storage, a lot of communications back and forth, and, and you got to make sure you, you orchestrate that properly with your synchronization capabilities. Um, and then, of course, the data that you have is going to be flowing back and forth, and, and it's interesting because uh, I'll show you a little bit about the, the evolution. That data doesn't just go from the physical to the virtual. You're not teaching the twin. In fact, the twin is teaching us as well. So it's kind of both ways, and we, get, we gotta look at that as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, visualization, I talked about it earlier. It's really important to make sense of it from our perspective. Um, I was talking to my colleague, Jeff, earlier about how, uh, imagine how machines now are able to do 120 frames per second. We can't, you know, we watch a movie maybe at 30, 20, something. Um, uh, 120 frames per second doesn't make any sense to us as humans, but it does make sense for these machines to go into high precision. Talked about precision medicine earlier. So that, that thing is very important from that perspective as well. And of course, as we looked at this across all of these uh, different sectors, aerospace and, and aviation is fairly advanced. Transportation is catching up. We're gonna see a lot of autonomous vehicles uh, or are connected vehicles that are, uh, have their own digital twins uh, that are running as they move around. If you're going from Boston to New York, you'll, you'll, uh, your digital twin will follow you or follow your car. Uh, construction, uh, it's kind of interesting. Retail is fairly advanced, 
but construction is catching up now, particularly from a safety point of view, uh, uh, in, in helping in that perspective. Financial services, you can imagine, we, we did a lot of simulation in finance for many, many years, but now they're looking at creating twins, and there are some of them, they're members in the, in the DTC. Um, energy, manufacturing, manufacturing is fairly advanced, probably the one that we could learn the most from when it comes to use cases and how can we do digital twin the best. Medical, I think you all know about that. Um, there are a lot of aspects, and one thing I wanna, as I look into the medical field, if you're looking at, a, at an, um, an emergency room and you look at all the machinery that's there, and you try to go back maybe 20, 30 years, you've got the same thing. It's really not that much evolution so far. Uh, maybe it looks a little different, you have nice screens and everything, but the technology underneath it is about the same. So we're moving to these software-defined medicine, leveraging digital twins, where you're gonna see these medical systems or medical devices becoming a little bit more smarter about how they operate. Uh, security is another one. You know, we ch we're challenged literally every minute uh, from a cybersecurity point of view, and, and this is an aspect that's gonna, we can learn a lot from. So, um, as, as we look into this, I wanted to share with you the different levels. What's the maturity level of these digital twins across different markets, right? Uh, the CAD systems that existed for a while, that are blueprints, uh, you still find a lot of companies, a lot of uh, institutions, a lot of uh, public sector, like in smart cities, using them. Uh, but level one is starting to catch up, and then level two, where the truly you're getting into the full logical model. And level three and four, particularly four, those are things of the near future, hopefully the next five years, as we have discussions with Dr. Greaves about this, the, the concept of intelligent, autonomous digital twins that are actually gonna learn on their own. You're not gonna direct them. You're not gonna be uh, uh, controlling the, the process of the learning, for example, et cetera. So just wanted to share this with you uh, to, to give you a perspective on this as well. And, and this is the evolution. So I, I actually borrowed this from Michael Greaves, from, uh, from his kind of position, although I don't agree completely with it, but I think it gives us a good picture to illustrate it with you on how we look at this from the perspective of what is, what is it that we can do today with the tools that are out there? What is it that we can do with the data that we have? And how can we improve that? Having digital twin platforms, for example, as an application, so going from the ad hoc which is kind of where we are at the moment, kind of within those, uh, I can't point to it, but you know, the, the third and the fourth level, but getting to the front running simulation, as I was saying earlier, instead of doing predictive, you're actually getting to the point where you're going to, the system is anticipating what you're gonna do next. It's trying to find, to search for more data, uh, for more insights, for more, uh, I was talking with Jeff about causality, not correlation. Uh, actually, Sean and I have talked about this quite a while, uh, a while ago as well. These are very important elements in your models, again, going back to the criteria that I mentioned, where we can kind of make sure that they, are, they have that level of fidelity and precision. This slide is just an example um, in the manufacturing world where you see that uh, digital world and physical world, how you're actually improving uh, from no data initially, now we're, now we're kind of at the third level, you have a certain level of context. I think here it's important, I, I heard some of the colleagues talk about the context. You can't just get any data, you have to make sense of it. You have to have metadata, thanks for doing that this morning. It's really important that we re relate that, but then going to live data, uh, David and I talk about active data, where this data has itself a certain level of behavioral criteria that would allow you to improve your data sets, to improve the, the, the training of your algorithms, and beyond that, to actually get to that level of causal relationship between your entities. And that's very important to have the better models for your digital twins. And this kind of shows you the, the interaction between, or at least I'm trying to compare the, the future of digital twins with the current digital twin solutions, right? Being passive versus active, right? Uh, being mostly offline versus always online, and that's a, a challenge for a lot of us in technology. Um, and being goal-driven, right? I wanna achieve this, I wanna see what happens if we 
if we brought all these data sets together, if we try to understand the, the different elements of, um, uh, of, of the input, right? I'm, I'm goal-driven. Uh, or being goal-seeking, right? A different aspect. And again, what I said earlier, being predictive versus front-running simulation. And that's always uh, important from that perspective. Uh, I think it's, it's kind of interesting to, to compare the two. How do we enable that level of intelligence in these digital twins in the future? And, and this brings up kind of this, well, what I call the power of cognitive models uh, and the future levels of intelligence or, or uh, say artificial intelligence inside the systems, right? So that we can complete that partnership that I had in my title. Um, let me give you a few examples. So at Dell Technologies, we, we have a number of partners and customers. One of them is uh, McLaren in Formula One. Uh, and this is kind of a fascinating example. I've been working with them actually for, for some time and seeing the kind of things they achieve by leveraging digital twins is interesting. They're not winning the championship, but they are, they have made a lot of progress as a, as a company. But what's interesting when you think about it, think about it more from the perspective of a very complex machine. So a human and a machine are in fact together where um, all these sensors that are put together, lots of information in split second so that you can achieve certain decisions. In fact, the outcomes, you, you don't even have that much time to decide. The machine has to do it. But the other thing that's interesting, I put it there in, in my notes, is the fact that they were able to reduce the time to build these vehicles, right? So they went from 48 months to less than 12. And they can actually, they say they can do it in six months. I would like to see that. Um, the, they also developed the hypercar in uh, less cost than uh, the usual, that's the expectations you can see there, uh, less than 500 million versus over a billion dollars. So it's not the numbers that matter, it's really the use of technology to achieve these outcomes, right? No matter what domain you're in, and this is a real example that uh, I wanted to share with you and hope this kind of uh, uh, illustrates it for you. Okay. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about the Digital Twin Consortium. Um, so when this was started, um, so Dell and Microsoft and a few other companies, Lendlease, one of them uh, uh, in construction, uh, started to kind of um, uh, put together a process towards uh, an, an adoption of this technology, because we can't do it in a vacuum, whether you're a company or a, uh, an institution or, or a, a consortium, you have to come together uh, from different aspects. As you can see, we have researchers, um, uh, technology providers, academia, governments, digital twin users, uh, and that's kind of interesting from that perspective as well. And, and these are the founders in the steering committee uh, that, that started it. We also created the number of liaisons, and I think with I2B2, there's a lot to learn from each other. And I'm hoping we can, we can take that to the next level in collaboration. Uh, and, and it's important because that's how we kind of enable better use cases so we can build these specifications of technology, but also end user involvement, right? And for that uh, purpose, they created these things that are called RBOs, regional branch organizers. There's one in India, one in Singapore, some in Europe. I think you can see the map. Uh, we just authorized one in the US. It's been slow because a lot of activity is going on here, but just to give you an idea. Uh, these are the working group. I'll just go quickly and without going into details, really the, there is one on healthcare, particularly I think it would be interesting to have discussions with them. Uh, but more importantly, I think there's a, a lot of interest in learning about use cases, so what you have to share, for example. So this is kind of an interesting periodic table, if you haven't heard about it. I'm actually very proud of this work. Um, uh, it's called the Capabilities Periodic Table. It's, it's a very interesting tool. You take this to use and you extract out of it the subset that you need to work with, right? Not all of it would apply to all the use cases, but when you think about it as a framework, you know, to deliver on a digital twin project. If you want to start tomorrow, you take this, it will help you. A number of companies have been doing this uh, already and we have some uh, open source use cases that have been uh, um, uh, already showcased inside the DTC. Uh, I won't go through them all. You'll have the slides and as David would say, I'm always available to, to follow up offline with you. And, and the other thing is this periodic table, when you implement it, you can also implement it both at the edge or at the cloud. There have been some 
uh, support there with Microsoft and others that have been participating, uh, Google as well, uh, to, to drive that to the next level. So these are the new members. There are a lot of members that come from the medical diagnostics, uh, uh, some discussions with NIH and a few others that join uh, uh, the Linux healthcare group and others. But as you can see, there are a lot of members that are end users that are coming to learn or share with us their challenges and their use cases. There are four airports that are looking at this from their perspective. And interestingly, the data is so complex and it's also subject to a lot of different regulations. It would be interesting to learn what they have been doing, and, and this could apply here. I think there's a lot to learn for us here at I2B2 as well uh, for, for the team here. Great. Uh, what next? I think this is my last slide. I had one more slide, actually, uh, Diane. I don't think we, we didn't replace it with the new deck, right, did we? Oh, we did. Uh, oh, no? That's okay. So what I was going to say, in that, in, uh, I added a quote from uh, uh, Robin Milner. Robin Milner was uh, uh, one of these brilliant academics from Cambridge University. I, uh, I had the, the, really the, I was fortunate to work with him a little bit, both as a mentor, as a colleague with one of the startups back uh, almost 20 years ago now. But what he said is that, you know, we have to look, us for, particularly as technologists, at uh, the foundation of uh, not, he doesn't call it computing, he calls it uh, informatics, right? Because um, as, as we look at the systems, as live systems, not just what lives in your computers, or your phones, but really in the real world. Uh, this was said like, again over a decade ago, but I wanted to leave you with that message because that takes us to that next level, that partnership of the human and the machine, where we're seeking ways to better understand uh, technology that we embed in systems or even in humans at, at some point, but also the technology that's living with us. Um, and, and again, as this distributed concept becomes global and scales to a certain level. So, so I wanted to share that and, and I will stop here if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you.